Hey everyone, this is The Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today I am coming to you all to review for The Cook of Castamar, aka La Cocinera de Castamar, directed by Iñaki Piñafiel and Noberto Lopez Amado, and starring Michelle Jenner and Roberto Enriquez. Story-wise, the series is set in 1720 Madrid during the reign of Philip V. It's here that we meet our main protagonist, Clara Belmonte, who, in the wake of a devastating tragedy, takes on a position as cook in the kitchens of the Duke of Castamar. Ironically, the Duke has suffered a similar tragedy with the loss of his wife, the former Duchess of Castamar. In spite of all this, the two are inadvertently thrust into each other's past, and the most unlikely of bonds is formed between the two. However, this budding relationship must also withstand a court full of intrigue and secrets and neither Clara nor the Duke are prepared for the unspoken dangers hidden within the walls of Castamar. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with the pros. <sighs> Where do I begin? So of course, as a fellow cinephile, I am into all kinds of film genres, but I have to say the one genre that is at the top, and I do mean the top of my list, period pieces and costume dramas. I love it. No joke, <laughs> okay? No, seriously, I love period pieces. I love costume dramas. And I've really been into that since I was very, very young and my appreciation and love for it has just increased over the years. If I happen to catch a glimpse of something that even remotely resembles a period piece or some kind of costume drama, it's game over. Oh, what's that I see? Do I spy with my little eye a film set in the past? Do I detect vintage costumes of a particular period in history? Am I observing production values and aesthetics that are replicating a bygone era? What can I say, man? I, I take this seriously. If I really had to jump back and then search through the archives of my memory, then I would definitely say that Who Framed Roger Rabbit was my first technical period piece. And it was a perfect film to really start me off on that journey because, of course, it was a perfect blend of live action and animation. But the story was also so compelling. It has this kind of mystery, noirish vibe that also bounces off of the quirkiness of the animation. And it really was the perfect film to get me started on that journey of appreciating films that were set in the past, in this case, in the 1940s which I also find strangely ironic because some of my favorite black and white old school Hollywood films are from the 1940s. I would say Titanic more than any film of the genre. That is the film that had the most significant impact on my experience as a young movie buff. It was just a completely like, whoa experience. I had no idea that it was possible to replicate a period in history, much less an entire ocean liner to that degree with that level of detail. Like I just will never forget watching that film when I was seven. And it really just changed everything for me. And for from then on, my love of the genre was cemented. <laughs> it was over. And there are so many others throughout the years, especially moving into high school and even college. But unfortunately, I'm gonna have to cut it off right there because if I were to really like sit down and list my experiences with costume dramas and period pieces, I kid you not, we would be here all day. And really, since I'm being reminded of just how deep my love for that genre goes, if you're watching, please let me know down below if you would be interested in seeing some type of ranking video as far as some of my favorite costume dramas or the most significant ones or some kind of list or ranking connected to costume dramas. I would totally be down for that. If anyone would be interested in watching that or seeing that, please let me know. So I'll say all of that to say how I found this show was actually while I was watching something on Netflix. And of course, when you pause your program, after a while, it'll show a screensaver of various programs, movies, shows that are also available on Netflix. And it just so happened that an image flashed across the screen one day and all I saw was the architecture in the background and I saw costumes. 
And it was immediately giving me like Versailles, Marie Antoinette, you know, the French monarchy. And I was like, wait a minute, what is this? I need to know about it. And so I looked it up and I saw when it was gonna come out and I was like, okay, when this show drops, I will be watching. And then additionally, this also falls into the romance genre as well. Now, romance isn't super, super high on my list, but I don't outright despise it like a lot of people do. What I will say is that as I've gotten older, I think I have a little less patience with how romance is depicted, especially by Hollywood mainstream film standards. And something that's really special about this series is how it actually tackles romance, because we are actually seeing an organic bond develop between our main two characters. It's not love at first sight. It's not, I love you, after three days. It's not sex driven, it's not goofy, it's not syrupy. It is somewhat of an unlikely relationship, but seeing the genuine progression of it, you really appreciate it. And it's definitely a change of pace what we usually see in that genre. And honestly, what makes it all the better is that Clara and the Duke are genuinely good natured, positive, charming people. So you're already rooting for them as individuals in spite of their trials and tribulations. And then seeing them also come together in spite of everything they've been through, I mean, it just makes you root for them all the more. However, there are also some other relationships that are here and they have a little bit of a twist to them, which I was here for also. There was one in particular that was really unexpected and I really love the progression of that. But I will leave the rest of that for you guys to discover yourselves. I also liked that just about every character here was compelling, even with the huge disparity in their personalities. There are some characters here that you will absolutely love, and there are some characters that you will absolutely hate. There are also some you're gonna start off hating and then end up loving, and some that you're gonna start off loving and end up hating. And then there are some where you're constantly going back and forth like, I don't know if I like you or despise you. I don't know if I'm rooting for you or if I just want you to die. <laughs> you know, like there's just a lot of complexity to that, which I love. We're not just getting good character, bad character, hero. 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 <sighs> it's not black or white with anybody. We're getting all these shades of gray, which is really, really compelling to watch. It also helps that just about every character that we see has a secret. So you can imagine the twists and the turns that happen in the story. And man, it is definitely a roller coaster ride, but it is one that I was completely tuned in for the entire time. And speaking of secrets, when it comes down to Clara's, it's something that really begins to complicate her job and her ability to do it, which of course just naturally adds to the suspense and tension of it all. And I thought that piece of it was really effective as well. I have to say, there are a lot of aspects of the story that was giving me Girl with the Pearl Earring mixed up with Dangerous Liaisons, which I love because I appreciate both of those films so, so much. There are a couple characters here that were giving me the Spanish version of Greet and Johannes Vermeer, and there are also another couple of characters that were giving me the Spanish version of the Vicomte de Valmont and the Marquise de Mertoy. I was like, wow. <laughs> I loved it though. I also really quickly wanted to shout out John Cruz who portrayed Gabriel. I really wanted to mention this character because he is a black character that factors into the story and is a central part of Castamar. They do explain how and why that is, so I won't spoil that, but I have to say it was really, really refreshing seeing a character factor into history this way because for those of you that don't know, <laughs> A lot of the history and a lot of the narratives that showcase black people or that black people are a part of, most of the time doesn't get told, AKA erased. For those who don't know, I am a huge Tudor history fan, not just movies, but so many different books and series, documentaries. I am a massive fan of that era in history. And even for me, with all the things that I've learned, I have recently, within the past couple of years, I have even learned about black people who existed during that era. There's this book I discovered that is up next on my list to read, and the title is Black Tutors, The Untold Story, written by Miranda Kaufman. And it is literally telling the stories of all of these black, non-enslaved people who lived and were a part of this society. Sailors, merchants, travelers, aristocrats. Take for example, John Blank, who was a royal trumpeter. 
He was present in Henry VII's entourage and he performed at both Henry VII's funeral and Henry VIII's coronation in 1507. Now, why didn't I know that in all these years of enjoying Tudor history? Well, we know why. But for me, it's so important that those narratives are brought to light. And I definitely appreciate the author for doing that. And so jumping back to the series, I really appreciated the fact that they incorporated this character and made him a central focus within Castamar. And actually what it brought to mind was John Amilcar. He was the adopted son of Marie Antoinette, who was the last queen of France. I don't know if it was intentional, but I did see a lot of parallels between Jean and Gabriel, and I really appreciated that. And of course, we are also not shying away from the discrimination of the time. So although we are dealing with the identity of this black person being embraced in this court, we also are dealing with the reality of people who are against that idea also which I appreciate because I don't want to disnify the black experience, but I also want the black experience to be explored with nuance and diversity and complexity. And I felt that Gabriel in his own way was absolutely representing that. And I thought the actor Jean Cruz did a great job bringing that to life. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to the cons. Have to say, didn't have that many. So a small con that I had with this series is that we get a couple of fencing scenes and believe you me, I am no fencing expert by any means, but I did think the couple of times we did incorporate that piece, it was kind of awkwardly handled. I'm not sure if it was the fencing choreography or if it was just the way it was filmed, but there was something about it that was like, mm, mm, I wish this had just a little bit more impact than it actually does. I think that a lot of us have become accustomed to the eight episode series format. I think that's become like a really widespread thing. It seems like a lot of series, especially in their first season, get an eight episode run, which is fine because for the most part from what I've seen, it usually works and it doesn't feel like we've ended too soon or it's not enough. Of course you want more, but usually it feels like, okay, we brought the story to a close. We've told it in an effective and efficient manner. In contrast, this series is 12 episodes, which for some might be a tall order. For me, it wasn't because I was so invested and engaged that it was totally fine. However, I will say that it leads me to my other con, which is that this series ends on somewhat of a whimper. I wouldn't say it's a disappointment, but it ends in a way that almost feels unresolved. Like, we see a completion of the story, but it feels like, <sighs> like it kind of lacks impact. And it almost feels like, okay, and that's a wrap. <laughs> you know, it was a little too abrupt. I think that if we had taken a moment and let that last moment and that last scene really just sink in and for us to see other people in that scene, you'll know once you see it. But I wish we had just kind of made that more of a like, yes, we are closing this out. And it felt more of a like a, okay, this is over. Okay, all right. <laughs> you know, so that was kind of unfortunate. And I think that along with that, you may or may not be disappointed by how certain characters' story arcs are resolved. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it either. It just kind of felt like an afterthought in my opinion. And given that so many of these characters are so rich and so layered and so interesting, I wish that we had found an equally interesting way to close out their stories. So I'm gonna go ahead and give La Cocinera de la Castemar an A minus. I am telling you, I had a blast with this series and it's really added to my appreciation for foreign series. I watched a couple prior to this, really enjoyed those, and then having the chance to experience this, I'm like, okay, <laughs> where are the foreign series? <laughs> like, it's over now, you know? Like, just like the costume dramas and how I can't get enough of those, now I'm be scrolling through all the foreign dramas, I'm not gonna know how to act, okay? Because, oh my gosh. And listen, I understand that foreign content isn't for everyone. I've never had an issue with it, but I still think for a lot of people, doing that for an entire film, let alone an entire series, is uh, maybe uh, jumping the gun a bit. But I would absolutely recommend this if you're a fan of romances, foreign content, 
if you're a fan of costume dramas and period pieces. Like, I definitely think this is worth watching. I had so much fun watching this. I was invested the entire time. And I'm also very confident that I will find another foreign series to enjoy because say what you want about Netflix. I know people have issues with Netflix, but their foreign content, I have watched so many enjoyable foreign films and foreign series so far, like mainly from Netflix. So you already know what time it is. I am all in. <laughs> the Cook of Castamar is currently streaming on Netflix. You guys feel free to check it out. Leave your thoughts below and let me know what you think. So once again, this is D Movie Man signing off and I'll see you at the movies.